treatment providers are being held responsible for individuals that are coming out of treatment and failing. Now, if you take an individual, say a diabetic, and he goes to the doctor, he's given some instructions, he's given some medication, and he's sent home on his way, and two weeks later he ends up in an ER in a co diabetic coma because he chose to not take his medications or eat a bunch of cake. Is the doctor blamed for that? Is the health provider blamed for that or held responsible for that? No, they're not, but the treatment industry is looked down upon as we're failing these people because they're not staying clean or, or abstinent or sober or whatever word you choose to use. I can't be held responsible for somebody and what they do after they leave my care. That, that's, that's ludicrous. So there's other things that need to change, and, I, and I, what I mean by that is I mean we need to look at um, you know, longer-term aftercare programs. If you look at where we see the highest success rates in the treatment industry, you're gonna look at airline pilots, doctors, medical professionals that are mandated by their board to do a five-year program. What I mean by a five-year program is there's a five-year aftercare plan that's set up in place where they're randomly t drug tested, they have to check in with the therapist. There's different things that they need to do, and it's a five-year plan. They're seeing 90-plus success rates in that, 90% success rates. And the statistics tell us that 10% of the people that come through treatment actually stay abstinence or experience recovery. So what is recovery? You know how I can't judge somebody's recovery. I can't say this person's in recovery because they, they no longer um, commit violent felonies or they no longer shoot heroin or they no longer smoke weed. Maybe they don't smoke, maybe they don't do heroin anymore, but they smoke a little weed on the weekends. So there's a lot of different things we need to look at. And, and one of those things is a longer term aftercare plan, I believe. And one of those things is how do we gauge success? Personally, myself, I've had to look at this thing and find a way for me to wrap my mind around what success is. And once again, being a person in recovery, being an abstinence-based person, you know, coupled with the 12-step fellowship participation, I have a personal preference that my, my recovery involves abstinence. That's just me. I've also learned that for me to impose my will on another human being is wrong, even if I'm right. I choose to look at success as a quality of life issue. So if I have an, a young man who's 32 years old, he's been living behind a dumpster for the last two and a half years, he's been shooting heroin, he's been breaking into cars, stealing out of cars to get money to score, he's been doing all this stuff and he comes through treatment, he does a 90 day treatment episode, he, you know, he does well, he, and, and he, he transitions out of treatment, he goes to sober living, and, and in six months to a year later, he's, he's self-sufficient, he has his own apartment, he's gainfully employed, and maybe he smokes a little weed now and then. Or maybe he has a couple beers after work on Friday with his buddies from the job site. Is that success? Depends on who you're asking. In my opinion, that's an absolute success because you look at the quality of life of this individual prior to treatment. Living behind a dumpster, now he has an apartment. Has a job, self-sufficient. That's a success. So I think looking at those things, you know, we need to change because people want to see outcomes. They want to see outcome data. You know, they want to see that, that treatment works.